flowers, Ken. <laughs> now, um, let me just give you a little overview. If you know, you've seen how many lectures, lectures you've got left, namely three after today, or four including today. Uh, we, I, I don't know if you have, if you've picked up a perspective of, you know, of, of all of computer graphics. Um, we have covered more material in this class than uh, either Jim Blinn or I took when we took a comparable class several years ago. So you've just you've just been given everything. <laughs> you, now you know everything there is to know about computer graphics. There's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing left. No, from now you're you're at the you're you're pretty close to the frontier. Mostly it is you're implementing something, and of course in implementing something you learn a, a whole heck of a lot anyway. And the fact of the matter is, for almost everybody in computer graphics, that's how they learn everything anyway. You know, got the papers, didn't learn much from the classes, just sort of get you pointed off in the right directions. If you don't feel like you're pointed off in the right direction, then computer graphics may not be your fort. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> But you've, uh, you've been given the overview. Now, uh, we have, uh, I think mean, both of us have, have left along little problems that, uh, and, you know, things we've discussed and brought out, and, and, and they're real problems. There are research problems that are, that are pretty close to the surface. Um, it's just a matter of, of finding them. It's, you know, if, if people are interested in hard problems, then, uh, gee, you've got hard problems. Uh, actually, that was the attraction of computer graphics, is that uh, because it's kind of ad hoc in nature, you you're actually get pretty close to the edge right away, and then you can start doing something that people haven't, been, haven't done before. Now, today, I want to uh, lighten up a bit, uh, partly because you've got a uh, take-home test here, which is this. Uh, it's simple. There are only four questions, I think. Is that right? Four questions, each one of six parts. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, uh, I don't think it'll be an easy test, and I, uh, um, I'm not sure how well I would do on it, actually. No, this, the, the terminology, I uh, hope you took good notes. I hope you took good notes. That's right. Um, Okay, right. <laughs> Go back and look at the tapes, right. Especially Jim Blinn's lectures. <laughs> Panic. <laughs> They're all in the library, right? Uh, now, the usual things apply to this test. Um, do it by yourself. <clears throat> uh, but it's completely open book. Open. Uh, um, I mean, you're perfectly welcome to go back to the tapes and look at them. Uh, the uh, purpose of the test is to get you to think about and learn things, of course. It isn't just a test. Uh, so far, as far as assignments go, we're, we're pretty pleased. Most people are diving in and doing reasonably good work. Um, and if you all do good work, then we can grade accordingly. We don't have to differentiate a lot between you. We need something to tell the difference. So uh, we'll see who blows the test. <laughs> <coughs> All right, today I'm going to talk about something completely different. We're going to talk about animation. If I can find my lecture notes. Oh, here we go. We're on top. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the main thing here that I'm going to talk about is, is uh, uh, two-dimensional animation. Now, let me actually break animation up into uh, different categories. Uh, there is, of course, three-dimensional animation, which uh, means you've got three-dimensional objects, which is the kind of thing we've been talking about in this class. And to animate them means that merely that you move them around in time. For rigid objects, that is a reasonably well-defined task. Uh, it's not hard to think about. It might be hard to do it well, but uh, there's nothing uh, strange about it. Uh, you, it, it. You could extend that to a, a place that is hard. That is, suppose you want to do non-rigid body motion. For instance, suppose you want to simulate a person doing something. Well, then you have to have a representation of this object 
which is not rigid. Uh, and then you have to be able to, to, of course, change that definition. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty hard. Take something like a, a uh, person. You know, I, the film I should have brought. Most of you probably seen anyway. The hand face film? Or the hand that was moving around? I'll have to remember to bring that next time. That was actually the first thing I ever did in computer graphics, was I made a model of a hand, and I moved the fingers around. Uh, and I enjoyed doing that, so that's, I decided to stick with computer graphics. <laughs> it was my, my class project. Now, the thing about a, uh, something like a body uh, is it is a very strange object. Take uh, uh, the hand itself. Now, the hand, you've got this, uh, these joints. Now, that's, that's sort of easy to think about. But you've also got this joint here with this great big glob of flesh around it. And it's not really a joint. It, it sort of swivels around because it's got this, this piece of skin uh, constraining it. Uh, now, another joint here is this one here, where uh, if you follow these two bones back to here, all right, now you twist them around. So the bones are going like this, right? All right, well, that's, that's pretty tricky to model. You could probably be clever and think of a way of doing that. Now you look back at the shoulder, all right? Who knows what happened inside of there, you know? And it's just, it's very strange if you think about it. And uh, the same is true with uh, the hip, um, not being uh, terribly uh, limber here. It's not that I don't exercise, but I just, you know. um, the hip behaves in very, very strange ways. Well, the approach I took with, for three-dimensional animation was to, uh, make each segment of the body a rigid object and then have a way of defining what happened at the joints. Uh, and in particular, if, if we had a, say this was the tip of the finger, that's a rigid object, all right, and that's the next section of the finger, then if this is the joint about which it rotates, then the, the polygon right there is a polygon who has a, a some point in this data set, another point in this data set. So that when the thing rotated and the, the thing came out like this, then this remained connected. Right, and that was all the matter of the way you structure your program. You generate the polygon so these things become connected. Well, it only sort of works. Uh, it only sort of works because that isn't really what happens with a, with a finger. And, and if you're far enough away, then who cares? But, but sometimes, especially when you get these funny joints in here, when the thing moves around, it behaves badly. It doesn't look right. And sure enough, you could see that in the hand, and I've seen it in bodies. I've seen lots of people who have made computer-generated objects. Um, and in general, they, they look right for some position. And then as they start to move them around, then the, then the joints do funny things. They just, they look odd. Uh, another approach is that of, uh, in fact, before I get the approach, I should, I should mention something else. If you have got uh, some object, there's a movie of this, you know, there's, let's say you've got an H, and uh, it's, it's defined with some point set with a certain topology. Now, you change the point set to be a different point set. And in this case, let's suppose it is a, uh, uh, it's an airplane. It's supposed to be an F-4 fighter or something like that. Um, but I don't know what they look like anyway, being some of a pacifist. Um, a big knife, uh, Fred Park uh, at the University of Utah did this. Uh, just, the, just a completely different topology, same topology, excuse me, different point set. And now you do a linear interpolation between the points. And as you do that in time, it changes one into the other. And of course, you can have an arbitrary number of point sets. Uh, that style of interpolation is frequently used. Uh, usually, people are showing off what they're doing. So they do something that, are, that is wildly different. And then they, one turns into the other, and, and uh, it looks kind of nifty, at least when, when this people first did it a few years ago. But in fact, the concept could be used uh, in animation. Now, in this particular case, uh, Suppose what we did was, instead of defining uh, 
a finger as these rigid objects, uh, this is an object, here's an object, and they're connected. Instead, we say that uh, there is an object which encompasses a joint, and it is where, let me try to draw a finger here. Instead of making the division of point sets this way, you, you make the division of point sets where it's rigid. And now you've got point sets to find for where the thing is bent one way or, or, or out ex in, in extreme. But the connection is always where the thing is rigid, and then you let the, the varying point sets take care of the, of the thing as it rotates. And, whether, and what point sets you, you interpolate between, and the amount of interpolation is dependent upon the position and the rotation. I don't know if anybody has done that. Yes? How, how do these things relate to homotopies? I've seen homotopies. I guess I don't know what a homotopy really is. I've just seen... I, do I don't movies. either. <laughs> okay. uh, Nelson Max had a bunch of movies about changing one shape smoothly into another shape. Right. And the use of some, some kind of mathematical art that's just called a regular homotopy. But you don't know what it is. No. Okay. Okay. It's easy, easy sort of question to answer. Turning his sphere inside out, partially. To go between, he made a bunch of models, and to go between the models, he used this homotopy stuff. Okay, yeah, I don't know the exact application. Of course, of course I've, I've seen his film. Um, in any case, in this context, to say bodies, I don't know anybody who's ever, ever done this, although interpolating the point sets under some rules, of course, has been done. Um, all right, another sort of three-dimensional animation uh, is uh, actually also the animation does with how do you represent some objects that we haven't talked about, like nobody's done hair well, cloth, um, given the texture right of, of various objects, uh, although people are getting better and better at it. Last week, Lauren talked about his fractal surfaces, and he made some images that previously nobody had ever been able to make before. Uh, and every year, you go to SIGGRAPH, and somebody has come up with a new technique, a new way of looking at things, and the images are starting to look better and better. Hence, that's why I say this, the whole field is open for research. Because if you look at the best of the computer-generated images, then, uh, and you look at real life, you'll notice there's a discrepancy. Uh, computer-generated pictures look neater, right, uh, than real life. In fact, what there's a word for the non-neatness, what is it? Patina? Patina? P-A-T-I-N-A. Yeah, there's, uh, oh, I've heard it used, uh, for, in fact, the people doing the special effects in Star Wars go to great trouble to make everything they're, they're working with look dirty. All right, and it's part of the process of making the model. They make the model, put it all together, then they throw sand on it and dirt and rust uh, and anything to make it, to give the texture of real objects. Um, all right, you know, there's, you know, there's a whole field of things that are open there. Uh, and then animating on top of that, of course, just makes it harder. Uh, so far, nobody's even seriously talking about cloth and, and hair and so forth. Uh, all right, that's 3D animation. <clears throat> now, the, uh, moving on to another issue, and that is uh, two-dimensional animation. No, excuse me, before we get to two-dimensional two animation, there's one other type of computer animation, and that is uh, the RT kind of animation, which says you've got a computer to produce images, uh, and it's, they're, they're very abstract. Uh, it's a matter of style. A lot of that stuff has been produced is uh, not very good. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why it's not very good. One of it is usually people doing it are not, don't have any artistic sense. Um, a second is that the, uh, is, while a lot of the pictures we're talking about may take an hour to produce, in general, the abstract images do not take an hour to produce. They only take a few seconds to produce. And therefore, it is easy to uh, generate a large number of frames. That's especially true with video art. Uh, you can generate stuff in real time now by turning knobs. 
Uh, therefore, one is thrown up rather quickly against a problem that is, uh, uh, has always been there in, in movie making, and that is you need to have discretion and taste. You need to edit. You need to throw away the things that aren't any good and keep the things that are good and put them together in a nice way. And that has usually been the weakness and the downfall of computer graphics and video art is the people putting it together do not edit what they are doing and do not tighten it up. And you can only take so much of colorizing, all right, and then it gets old in a hurry. Now, there, uh, there has been some, some of this sort of work which looks very good, but the difference is always ours. It doesn't have anything to do with the computer. All right, <clears throat> finally, the last category is that of, of conventional or, or two-dimensional animation. Uh, within the field of conventional animation, there is a, uh, you know, there's a whole gamut. And basically, anything you can draw can end up on the film. Um, I would like to uh, address myself mainly to uh, cartoon-style animation. Uh, th there, of course, is uh, abstract animation with conventional art. Uh, that abstract art, in, in general, tends to be better than the abstract art done on computers, mainly because it's so much work to generate it that people don't want to generate it unless they're sure that it's right. It's not a matter of turning a knob or changing a parameter. Okay. On the uh, regular two-dimensional animation, uh, you could think of it as being on a continuum. And at one end of the continuum, we have got uh, Pinocchio, which was, uh, well, I, th well I, th I think it's the finest animation, feature, full-length feature animation that's ever been done. And that's just not my opinion. I, th I think that among connoisseurs of, of computer animation, that is, that's the very best. Pardon? No, no. No, this is all conventional. No, they didn't, uh, they didn't have computers and they did Pinocchio. You mean the film Pinocchio or the class of Pinocchio and Snow White? And no, Pinocchio. Okay. Pinocchio was the best. If you ever get a chance to go see Pinocchio, go look at Pinocchio. I mean, it is really amazing when that whale swims through the water you can't believe that those guys drew all that stuff. And then you have know, rouge on the lips, and when he's dancing in front of the, uh, the, the little uh, light, then you can see the shadow through his legs. Just, it's amazing. All right, that's Pinocchio. Uh, then there are, uh, you know, then there are the Disney films. You know, most of them aren't quite as good uh, as that one. Then there are uh, some of the commercial release things like the Charlotte's Web and some of the uh, uh, other studios will come out with a full length feature and it'll be full animation. It won't have this polish that this will, but I will put a lot of work into it. Um, then uh, of course the Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> over here <laughs> uh, where uh, one does not animate. One uh, gives the illusion of animation. Uh, for instance, if the boat crashes into the dock, you don't show the boat crash into the dock. You show the dock and you vibrate it. All right. I mean, serious. That's how, right. That's what that's what they do it. Uh, there was uh, at New York Tech, they had a, an animator there, uh, Johnny Gentililla, who was one of the animators on Popeye. He was one of those that worked on the simplification of Popeye. And he was very adamant about uh, that simplification. He believed that, that when you're having cartoons, and I hope he never sees his tape, <laughs> when, he, when, he's showing car when, you're, when you're looking at cartoons, you should just be looking at what the focus of attention is. Right? That's, that's the object. And the other things are, that are there distract. So if Popeye's doing something, then you're looking at Popeye. And you don't want to have other stuff going on because that takes away. Well, it's all drivel. It's not true at all. Uh, in fact, it is the things that distract that make it more lively. The films that you probably enjoy the most are the, are the things that are visually rich. I mean, you've got a brain which is supposed to take care of visually rich things. 
And if the only thing moving on the darn screen is the lips and occasionally the eye blinking, <laughs> all right, that to me is distracting. Uh, and it's distracting to kids too. I, I think kids like things that, that look better. It's an opinion. I mean, they do sell that stuff. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I hope he doesn't see that. <laughs> Well, some of those older cartoons uh, look pretty nice. I mean, like a lot of the, a lot of the Bugs Bunny ones and so forth uh, have got a lot in them. Um, I don't. I haven't really seen a lot of them. Uh, as I say, I would say this is the, the greatest feature length thing. I've I've seen some really short things, which were also really superb. Um, but but you have to look at this in its detail to realize how truly <laughs> truly amazing. <laughs> you know, over the last several years, you keep hearing somebody saying, well, there's this new studio up, and they're going to bring back the old uh, Disney do-it-all. And, and uh, let's see, the last one I heard was the Japanese company. They're going to put a lot of money and hire all the animators, and they're going to do something really great. And they just came out with this film. It was on the Greek mythologies. Oh, Winds of Change. Winds of Change. Yeah, yeah. Terrible movie. Oh, it's bad. Bad. Oh, you keep hearing it though. People want to do that old stuff again. What about uh, the Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's that's the the oh, let me let me tell you. I uh, last Friday, uh, I and a couple others went to see uh, Wizards and uh, what's the other music one? No, no, no. The, the, oh, um, American Pop. American Pop. Boy, was I backsheet out that night. <laughs> <laughs> American Pop, well, uh, uh, except for one guy had reverse opinions. I kind of enjoyed American Pop. I don't exactly have his view of the world. Uh, and, but Wizards, I got kind of bummed me out. Uh, he, uh, but he tries hard. Uh, I mean, I'll say that much for him. He's always this guy, he gets 90% uh, of the way there. He always falls flat on his face the last 10%, but he gets 90% of the way. Which is better than most when they get 10% of the way there. All right, why is it so darn hard? Let's go over the conventional process and figure out why it is that they're screwing up. All right, the first step in making an animated film is you gotta have a story. Unfortunately, that's where most of them fall down. <laughs> All right, right to begin with. Uh, that. Uh, Actually, it's a very serious thing. I, I, I'm not sure why that happens. It also happens with live action films. Uh, part of it may be that the, uh, the movie business in itself is a risky business. Something like 90% of the films that are started never make it to the screen. Uh, as you, 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 that is, once you get to the point where you've got a story, see, there's 100% with a story, and now you find that uh, they die for a variety of reasons. Um, because it's high risk, then the executive, and this is purely my opinion, uh, tend to cut down on the risk wherever they can. And so they then try to take all the unknowns out of the process. So they'll just use known directors, known actors, uh, known writers, and so forth. Well, some of those known writers are known for the ability to produce on time, which is an important quality to have. Uh, unfortunately, they can't write worth anything at all. And, you know, that's obvious, right? And some of them are terrible writers if they've got jobs because they do produce on time. I'm, I'm diverging here, <laughs> divulging. Uh, all right, then we go to a storyboard. You've got to uh, commit this story into uh, into drawings, and that's a talent in itself to figure out what the look of the film is supposed to be. Um, you've got to produce a soundtrack. All right, you go off to Italy or somewhere where the, the rates are lower and you produce a soundtrack. Uh, then you've got to read the soundtrack. You need to pick out of the soundtrack every significant event that you want to time something to. So if there are any bops, pangs, clips, 
or, or any perversions of those words I just said, uh, any dialogue where you must sync up to it, then they have to find out when that happens exactly. <clears throat> All right, now they've got this uh, storyboard. Now, there's a little simplification in this, of course. We've got uh, the animators. Now, the animators are the ones who uh, uh, put the life into this. It's given that basic storyboard, they draw where things are to go, what the action is. They know fluid motion. They don't draw every frame. They're good, they're talented, and it's a waste to have them draw every frame. They will draw maybe every seventh frame or eighth frame. It's very tricky stuff. They'll draw a lot more. If it's easy stuff, they'll draw a lot less. All this is drawn on paper with pegs on it, or peg holes. They then give it to the assistants. Assistant animators. Now, the assistant animators will draw in some of those missing frames, but not every one. They will also clean up the drawings. The animators will, will usually draw very sketchily. They'll just, you know, they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say how the, the thing is to look here and, and I have no idea what this is, but, all right, they'll, but they'll get the action in right. The assistant has got in front of him a model sheet of whatever characters to look like from several different points of view. He'll make it neat, and he'll have it fill, follow all the rules, and then he'll draw in some of the missing frames. And then he will then give it to the in-betweener. who will draw in all the remaining frames. This group of three are, make up what are usually thought of as the, uh, the animation department. These are the people actually doing the animation work, and this is a hierarchy. A young person coming to this portfolio, if he looks like he has promise, he'll do in-betweening work, uh, and he will he'll develop his skills, they get better and better, then become an assistant, and, uh, and if he's got it, if he's able to, then synthesize these actions in his head, you move up and become an animator. And this may take years to move up. Yes. Could you give a relative numbers and all that? And I mean, to, I mean, for a particular project, I mean, how many of one do you need for how many of the other? Oh, actually, I don't know the numbers. Don't know them. Yes? Uh, I was going to ask a question. But are there 100 in-betweeners, 10 assistants, and one animator? Or is there one in-betweener and 10 assistants? Well, um, the, the studio that I work with intimately was a small one, uh, and it's hard to say how it would be for a place like either Hanna-Barbera or Disney. But my guess is that, uh, it's just strictly ballpark, that there are uh, maybe uh, a few more assistants and animators and then a few more in-betweeners than that. As you could think of, there's a, there's a fallout of people who don't make it to here and, and a fallout of people who don't make it to here. That's as close as I can come. Uh, <clears throat> parallel to this, there is the, uh, the background painting. These people are skilled at making backgrounds. They work off the storyboards. And of course, there's got to be a cooperation between the background painting and the animators, because the animation, of course, has to happen relative to, to something. Um, now, once the animation is done, you've got this paper. You send the paper down to the uh, camera room. They just lay the paper on top of each other, and they will backlight it and photograph it on black and white film. So they're, they're photographing the the pencil drawing, so they're making what are called pencil tests. They will then look at the pencil tests in real time. It isn't until they get these pencil tests back that they're able to check out uh, what really happened in, in real time. Until then, the best they can do is flip the drawings. In fact, I asked uh, one of the assistant animators, no, excuse me, one of the in-betweeners once, uh, why it is that, uh, wait a minute, what was the question? 
Oh, I know it's, they have the darn pegs on the bottom of the paper. There's a third drawing on paper. They've got these peg holes, a round one and an oblong, oblong one there. And they're at the bottom, which I thought was annoying because that's where your hand was. And I asked him why that was. And he said, well, the reason is that uh, it is easier to, to flip if you, have, if you have then got the, you can hold the paper from the bottom and, and flip this way. Uh, I then asked one of the uh, old animators why they had the peg holes at the bottom, saying that, that, that one of the in-betweeners had told me it was because of the way they flipped the paper to check out the drawing. He says, oh, it has nothing to do with flipping. Uh, flipping is the way you learn how to do it. I and mean, you, you will, whether the top or the bottom, you'll learn how to flip the right way. They're that way because when you photograph it, you've got a platen of glass holding this paper down. And the platen lifts up from the back. So you want the pegs down here so you can get them off easily. And so that's the reason the peg holes are usually on the bottom. All right, and there are little historical things there that, that uh, uh, there are the ways that they do things. And of course, we've talked about bringing in the computer. We've got to know what it is we want to throw away and what we want to keep. Uh, whether or not it's there because of some good reason or because it's a historical accident, because that's where the glass came down. Yes? Is the uh, pencil test combined with the soundtrack? Yes. Yeah. Because, because they're all synced together now. All right. Once the pencil test comes back, if it isn't right, then it will go back to these people to fix it. Uh, if, you're, if you're at Hanna-Barbera, then unless there is an out-and-out -out mistake, which is what they're checking for, then it will just go ahead. Uh, if, if, however, they're after quality animation, then it will go back to make the animation look better. And at Disney Studios, they will make several iterations to make the animation look better. And hence, it is much more expensive because that's how their people are tied up. All right, once the pencil tests are accepted, it then goes to uh, the Xerox room. Uh, there are actually a couple of choices. One is to trace the, uh, the drawings onto acetate. But I think that's what they did with that winds of change. Metamorphosis, winds of change. It was based on metamorphosis. Yeah, OK. They actually inked the drawings. So they went to all that work to get them on there. In fact, the theory was that Disney used to ink them. And that's a sign of quality. Um, and, but the problem is that inking them is not a sign of quality. Ink is one of many aspects having to do with the look of a film. And, and just inking does not mean you've now made a Disney-style film. It means that you've inked the lines. That's all that it means. Uh, for a, f a few years, or for a few films, Disney Studios did most of their stuff in Xerox. And I think the stuff they're doing now, they've gone back to inking because it looks better. They're, they're, the lines have a rougher quality. If you look at things like uh, Sword in the Stone, Sleeping Beauty, uh, the characters have got a rougher look to them. I don't know if it's Sleeping Beauty, maybe not that one. But 101 Dalmatians, for instance. Uh, just, just they're dark, black-looking lines. Now, these are not real Xerox machines. These are Xerox rooms. Uh, at Disney Studios, for instance, what they have is a uh, is a room with a lens in the wall. And then there's a conveyor belt going like this, and another conveyor belt going out like this. And a guy sitting here uh, taking the plates off here, putting them up here to photograph, and then putting exposed plates onto here. I think three or four women back in this room who were uh, uh, fixing it off, off these zinc plates on acetate, fixing them and so forth. And there's another person out here loading up the drawings onto a platen. And then the people would rotate through the, through this, through the day. Uh, at uh, Hanna-Barbera, they have more conventional-looking Xerox machines where they just put it down on a machine and it's photographed. In fact, they may even do that at Disney now. It was, I think, eight years ago when I saw this room at Disney Studios. Uh, all right, so it's uh, inked on acetate. And then it is painted. They got lots and lots of people in this great big room. They'll take uh, one color at a time and they'll paint in this thing on the back. And then they'll put it up to dry and they'll move on to the next cell. 
uh, and they'll paint uh, something like, I think they can average 10 cells an hour, depending on the complexity, of course. Uh, the colors are really tricky because you, if you've got a green color, then there are really, say, five different greens depending upon the level you're at. If you've got more acetate in front of you, then you use a different shade of green so that they all look the same from the camera. So there's an art to making that look right. So finally, it's uh, photographed. <coughs> and uh, after it's photographed, uh, you've, you've got the, the final film that goes for cutting together. Now, you look at that process, and you would think, you know, there must be something we can do to help that along a bit. It's so tedious and difficult that uh, uh, it's no wonder that it's done badly so much. It's very expensive, very labor intensive. Now, in the past, people have looked at this process and they said, oh, well, let's put in a computer to help. And they have concentrated on this step right here, saying, let us have the computer do the in between. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were several people, lots of papers written several years ago on how to do automatic in-betweening with the computer. The paper was written and published. And what they did is they had some little figure that looked like this, and then it turned into a two. Or they had some character like this, and then they did the character again, and he frowned or something like that. And they wrote a paper saying, well, <clears throat> we can now have the computer do automatic in-betweening. Uh, now, uh, uh, the studios can use this and it's going to change everything. Well, it didn't change anything. Uh, because the problem turns out that it's, it's much harder than what people originally thought. To be able to turn one line into another, which is not very hard, is not the same thing as being able to do full animation. Now, the problem on the surface seems simple enough. You've got two figures, let's say A and B, and, and all you want to do is find a correspondence between the lines in the two figures and once you found the correspondence, say one's at frame one and one's at frame five, then you could do an interpolation between the lines in the, in the intervening frames. It's not unlike another problem that most of you have, have, are now aware of in computer science. And that was, uh, uh, let us suppose that we have two languages, say English and Russian. And it seems like it should be a simple matter to establish a correspondence between the words in the two languages such that you could go from one to the other, right? Um, and in fact, the same sort of thing happened. There were some early papers on people who were just right at the verge now of, of translating English into Russian. Well, as we know, it, uh, it didn't quite happen that way because it required some intelligence, in fact, to really make the translation. Similarly, with animation, uh, these people are not just converting one line into another. Uh, what they have in front of them is a two-dimensional projection of the, the, the model in a person's head. And there are lines missing, and there are all sorts of funny things that are happening with that image. And it requires an understanding of what the image is before one can really interpolate between them. Uh, all right, so that's, that's one level of problem. The second area which has been very successful is that of uh, the uh, painting of the, uh, of the images themselves. That's been done on a computer, and I will show you images shortly. We have a couple of videotapes uh, that we'll show. Unfortunately, you won't see the color because we don't have a color monitor up here. Uh, but we do have a film. Uh, the painting on a computer is, uh, we timed it for some tests we're doing, roughly 12 times faster than uh, uh, doing it by hand. And, that, and this is what they're trying to do down at Hanna-Barbera Studios right now. I'm, I'm sort of rushing now. I, uh, I can't continue a real nice logical development because I've got three things I want to show you. Uh, the painting works very successfully. The background works very successfully. Uh, the best integration of all these has been at New York Tech. And what I'm going to show you is my own version of an of an in-betweening program. And this is the thing that I wrote at New York Tech. And this is on the film that we'll show. 
the, uh, uh, the, the problem we had to overcome in particular was the training of people. We're going through a tape change now. Uh, I'm going to go... Uh, no, they're, uh, they're, they're 9 by 12 inches, and the figures are maybe that high on them, varying, of course. Uh, we uh, put together an animation system. Well, I wrote this thing. It took me, uh, I guess, nine months to write it. <coughs> uh, I then had animators over to use it. This John and Jen, another old guy. I think they're like 65, 70, something like that. They got on there. They pulled their hair out. They, uh, they hated it. At least I took it very personal, of course, because I wrote the thing. Um, you know, that monitor's kind of jittering. They, uh, <clears throat> uh, it just, it was a complete bust. They didn't like the computer stuff at all because it did require, they established the correspondence between the lines. I, there's no artificial intelligence in there at all. Um, and so it, it died, it went away. Uh, and they went back to doing what they had been doing all their lives, and that was to draw this stuff on paper. And so the thing was put away for a half a year. And then there was a lull, and a couple of the in-betweeners who were young uh, were kind of bored because they didn't have a particular project, and they thought they'd like to just play around on the computer. So I went back and resurrected that program and uh, spent uh, uh, a few months, I guess it took me two or three, uh, to take it. It was running on 1170. It was a big program. And put it down onto an 1134 with an overlay program. A very fast response. I hate 16-bit address spaces. <laughs> and we got here, so we got VAXs or 68,000. There's no way in the world I will ever touch a 16-bit address space again in my life. And we spent a lot of my time worrying about getting things into overlays instead of worrying about the problem. Another diversion. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, those guys got on it, and it took them a matter of a day or two, and they were off using it. Uh, and they loved it, and they're still using it. Because I left. That's when I came to Lucasfilm. I got this thing looking for them, and I took off. Uh, and so the thing now is in an unchanged state, since nobody else can touch the overlay structure. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, we made up at that time a demo film of them using this thing. And we'll see a little thing called the rooster piece, which is kind of dumb. And then another piece that they put together uh, called Kangaroo Buckaroo. There's the guy who did this, put together Kangaroo Buckaroo, and he really designed it from scratch. Let me show you first the slide, and then the film. The slide so you can appreciate how difficult automatic in-betweening is. needs to be focused. Now, <clears throat> the animator drew the top and the bottom frame. All right, that's what he drew. The assistant drew in the middle frame. So I think we've got frames one, five, and nine. I'm not exactly sure the numbers. I've got the original paper somewhere. That's from a real picture that they were working on. All right. Now, let me go to the in-betweener. The in-betweener has got to produce the correspondence between, uh, let's say, this, this guy and this, this one, this one. Um, now, if you look at that, you can just see that there are, this whole arm here doesn't appear in this one. Well, if you're to do that automatically, what do you do? How do you do it? Uh, and there have been papers written on people trying to solve this problem of uh, using, uh, uh, skeletons and relating the skeletons to the actual objects or three-dimensional objects or transformations and there are all sorts of hairy things. 
none of it, to my knowledge, has been uh, successful in a practical sense. The problem is, is in order for the person to set this up so the automatic in-between works right, it takes a fair amount of time. And the amount of time is greater than it was to just sit down in the in-between thing by hand. You don't save a lot. Uh, the approach we were taking was to say that for a certain class of animation, let us recognize what the limitations are and have the animator uh, animate to what can be done on the computer. So we're not doing the same thing. We're saying here's a different tool you produce a different kind of animation. So with that in mind, and they're not claiming to uh, be redoing Pinocchio, I'd like to show you what they did as their first little piece. Let's try the film now. <coughs> I'll narrate this because it doesn't have sound. All right, that's slightly out of focus. This is Francis. Francis is our user. Is that, can there be a little bit of focus on that? It's out of focus. Now here you see him drawing this little rooster. Yeah, it's better. All right, with well, the, the peg holes in the bottom. And this is round and you can turn it. All right, there is extreme. Now this thing, was, the extremes were originally all done in paper. In fact, most of the work is done in paper. This is the production manager who traces in the drawings. Um, and he is the one who makes the correspondence. Now, there's a database management system for animation. It's something I didn't talk about because I just ran out of time. Uh, it, for every, well, this is a list of the, uh, of the sequences in this particular film. And so by touching one of the sequences, uh, we, we call up that sequence. And now up comes a list of the scenes that are in that sequence. A scene is a contiguous piece of action, and a sequence is just a whole different part of the story. Now, here is the, what's called the exposure sheet for a particular scene. There is a row for every frame in that scene. And this table, of course, can be very large, and so there are tools for moving around the table. Now, the, and these things over here are the names of the particular figures that are drawn. Uh, you'll notice the background names repeat over and over again, which means that it appears in every frame. Uh, so what, he, what here, what is here really are pointers to uh, these particular things. In fact, each one of these drawings is a file. And that's the name of the file. So it's just instances of, of the character. Is this real time that we're going through on that? Yeah, that's real time that you're seeing there. Now, um, that's me, because I didn't get connected, right? I'm just drawing to show that you're watching in real time. Um, what happens. Uh, and at the top, there's a menu of, of the things uh, that you can do. And of course, you can create geometric objects. Uh, you can delete uh, any particular object, any line. Uh, and there's just a variety of tools for making the lines look better for sticking in, in tools. No, this is a, uh, a uh, graphic wonder from Three Rivers. This is the GDP, the graphic display process. Uh, whenever I delete lines, I redraw the picture. There are certain things that cause me to redraw the picture. Should I send it off to the drawing? You'll see better drawing later on. Okay. Now, of course, you can zoom in on this thing. Oh, this is just line editing stuff. Now, I must say that a lot of time is spent trying to make this foolproof. The, the animators, by hitting the wrong buttons, never did crash this stuff. I know you see the GDP at the top. It's really a green phosphorus, not black and white. 
It's just because it was black and white film. And his normal configuration is that's not that high. It was a special setup for filming. This is the Taos pen, which was uh, not a good pen. Nowadays, black and white film used to be fairly dense. You'll notice it's not dense anymore. Kodak, uh, it's cheaper on the silver. Every time a line is drawn, then the line number appears on the screen just as a little visual feedback, as well as the name of what this particular file was. It's no woman who traces in drawings. Her training is as a painter. different drawings up there, we've got to be able to interpolate between them. And so there are various tables to indicate where the camera's looking and uh, the way at which the interpolation happens. So by default, there's a linear interpolation, which that represents, but you can change the rate of interpolation. This lets you indicate how you want to zoom in on the action that's taking place. And then finally, you can indicate that the camera is to follow a path. This is what they call a field guide. So it indicates where the camera is to be looking on any particular frame. All right, here's the animation. Well, just repeating it. Now, what he can do, uh, here's with his background. So this is now real time off the disk. But you can stop it. Now, here you're looking at the whole screen. Uh, a person with a cursor should appear, and he can stop it in any frame. Or the, or the color it now, I guess. All right. Now, let's have the coloring happens. You touch in, and it fills in an area. I think Albie talked about uh, the fill algorithm. Well, this is the tint fill algorithm. And this is how the coloring. You can see how the coloring is much, much faster than it is with conventional coloring. It's a big win. Let's see, for whoever is setting up the videotape at the other end, there's not time to see both of them, and I would like to see the second videotape first, the one that says Kangaroo Buckaroo, if somebody's listening. Is there a particular reason why you use the uh, vector display to set the drawing versus the raster? Yeah, this is the whole reason, real-time playback. Okay. All right. Now, here's the whole sequence they put together. And here you see the cursor stop at any frame, check out what any frame is, go forwards and backwards. And that's the whole reason for the calligraphic display. Oh, it's not bad at all. Each drawing is a file. It's a small number of lines. Well, yeah, lines. Uh, here we see it in color. Yeah, I'll color them. Yeah. 
we're going to see any of that. All right, so let us go on to the, uh, we're actually going to show that whole thing as a videotape. It's a crummy story, and since we're about out of time, let's show the kangaroo buckaroo. Kangaroo buckaroo is, is, a, is the same fellow, but he now designed the whole thing from scratch to go on a computer. This was originally artwork that was done for conventional animation. Uh, and he was excited about it because now he did everything himself, and he claims that he could do five times the work that he could do conventionally. He says he did the work of five animators plus five assistants plus five in-betweeners. I think that was an exaggeration. Uh, but, uh, and, and then of us, it's a rather limited animation. But let's show that. And this does have sound with it. I hope we get sound here. Actually, that was done with the same 2D animation program, too, which surprised me since they have a lot of 3D work there. That's the end of that tape. <clears throat> now, that's, all right, that's limited animation. But the nice thing about it is that a, a, a couple of people did it. It didn't take many people. And uh, they liked it, they were excited about it, and the guy did something that couldn't done otherwise. Uh, there are other places where there are two-dimensional animation programs. One of the most notable is in, Can in Canada with the Canadian Film Board. Um, and there are a few places where they're using these two-way systems in a commercial environment. But in my opinion at the moment, it's still the best program. But it's still, you know, it's not Pinocchio. <laughs> not that long shot. Did you do any um, um, automated in-betweening there? Because you had like cactuses turning into marshmallows and things and it seemed like... Oh yes, he did lots and lots of automatic in-betweening. Large. You know, how many frames did he have to draw and how much did he Well, he, uh, I asked him for numbers once, but, but the thing is, is that different, he said things like it's 10 to 1 or 20 to 1. Well, 20 to 1 is one second. The thing is, there are certain things in the background which don't change much, and therefore you, you're drawing some figures and you can have them change slowly. Uh, whereas uh, other action, they've got to draw more. But, but they did take full advantage of it. And that was his first piece, which he asked to design for use on the computer. <laughs>